Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at aggregate demand. So this here, this idea of aggregate demand, really what we're doing is we're going to be building off of our Keynesian cross model. So Keynesian cross, that's what we spent the last week looking at. Quite a, well, compared to what we've been looking at, it was a lot more mathematically intensive than anything else in this course. And all of that is going to be coming with us as we move forward to build this aggregate demand. Now, the problem where a lot of students end up having difficulty with this aggregate demand is that we take that entire Keynesian cross market or model and we put it inside a black box. That is, we say, great, you understand this Keynesian cross now. Let's crumple it up into a black box. Let's put it behind the scenes. And now it is the puppet master controlling this aggregate demand. So... That is, you have to be able to work through that Keynesian cross model, the impacts of different shocks to that Keynesian cross model, in order to be able to understand what's happening with this aggregate demand. All right, that seems, that seems like a big task. Well, let's walk through it. Let's take a look. So in today's video, we're going to start off with the Keynesian cross again. We're going to talk about those assumptions. We're then going to relax the assumptions of the Keynesian cross to see what happens and see that, hey, by relaxing those assumptions, we end up deriving what is known as our aggregate demand curve. In follow-up videos, we'll go and we'll briefly talk about the aggregate supply, and then in that same one, we'll wrap up aggregate supply into determining our equilibrium for the market altogether, macro shocks, our business cycle, and returning to long-run equilibrium. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's going to be in another video altogether. So for today, let's go jump over. Let's go take a look at our Keynesian cross and build up to our aggregate demand curve. So let's start off with an example. So here we have our case here. We have initially to start off a bunch of information. Uh, we have our level of, right? And keep in mind, this is little c, i, g, x. These are all autonomous components. What we mean by autonomous components is that they are not directly influenced by income. What you can think of this as is kind of like your cell phone bill. All of a sudden you get a big raise at work, you're not gonna go and all of a sudden start paying more in your cell phone bill just because you have more money. However, you get a raise at work and you might increase the amount of money you spend on clothing. You might buy some nice new fancy clothing or more clothing altogether, right? So in that example there, the amount of money you're spending on clothing, that's our induced, right? That there is going to be our induced parts. That is, hey, that's dependent on your level of income. But your cell phone bill, how much you're going to spend for your cell phone, well, that's autonomous. Things can change, right? You go to renew your contract and prices have changed and now you have to spend more or less, on your cell phone bill, but it's not changing in relation to your income. And that's really the idea there with our autonomous expenditure. It's autonomous from our income. Okay, with our Keynesian cross model, we had two big assumptions. These two big assumptions were assumptions. First is that the entire economy, our markets and everything are demand driven. That is, hey, output is demand determined, demand driven. That is the amount of stuff we decide to produce is entirely determined by the amount of demand we have, the amount we want to expend. That is why this is an entirely an expenditure model. It doesn't matter about the firm side because the assumption is that firms can meet any level of demand. If all of a sudden we have a spike in demand, firms are like, great, we'll just produce more. So... That was our first assumption of this model, is that, hey, output is entirely demand determined. Our second assumption is kind of based off that first, and that is that, hey, big spike in demand, firms can just handle that. Firms can just ramp up production without changing their costs. So that is in this model here. Our assumption is that prices are constant. That is, I'll say prices are fixed. There's no changes in our price levels as we work through things. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Every time I go to the supermarket, apples, they are a different price. Bananas, they're a different price. They're 66 cents a pound this week. They're 78 cents a pound next week. Ah, I don't think prices are actually fixed in reality. 
that's, that's exactly right. And so in this model, as we move forward, we're going to be able to relax these assumptions. First, primarily, this whole price is our fixed one. And then as we build into our aggregate demand and aggregate supply, we'll relax that, hey, our economy is demand driven as well. That, hey, maybe there's a pretty powerful supply side to consider as well on this. But let's start off. Let's create our economy based off of the information provided, based off of these two assumptions, and see what we have going on here. So, okay, to start off, we have our planned aggregate expenditure. Now, planned aggregate expenditure is derived from our expenditure approach. So that's consumption, investment, government expenditure, and net exports. Okay, as we go through this, well, our consumption, and well, we can open up net exports. Let's just open up net exports right now. Let's open that guy up to be our exports minus our imports. So our consumption and our imports are actually consumption and import functions. That is in yellow there, I have that they're induced. That is the level of consumption we have and the level of imports we have are going to be directly related to our level of income. That is our level of GDP, our level of output. Keep in mind, income, output, GDP, expenditure. These are all synonymous when we're talking about them on aggregate for an economy on whole. Very similarly, investment, government expenditure, and exports, and in fact, a little bit of our consumption, these guys are all autonomous. That is, they're not going to be related to our income. They're going to be more or less set, and they're going to be fixed unless some shock, like a change in our cell phone bill, right, because we renewed our contract. Outside of a shock like that, they're going to be constant. So opening these up, let's start off by opening up our consumption function. Well, our consumption is a function of disposable income. So we have marginal propensity to consume times our disposable income plus, and let's, let's make that a little fancy C to kind of differentiate it from that C we have up there because this here is my autonomous consumption. I'm then gonna have investment, government expenditure, exports, and then minus, well, I'm gonna have my import function. So let's get that guy. That will be M Y. Okay. Let's talk about all these components. Let's give them a name just in case we've forgotten, just so we can hey, make sure we're all on the same track as to what exactly all these variables mean. So starting on the left and working our way right. So on the left hand side altogether, we have PAE. That's our planned aggregate expenditure, right? This is as you, if you were your budget, for what we're planning to expend on all of our different parts as an economy on whole. Keep carrying on, MPC, this is our marginal propensity to consume. What this here measures is for every extra dollar of disposable income, how much of that I'm gonna spend on consumption versus savings. Right, I have two options with my disposable income. I can either eat it today or I can save it to eat it tomorrow. Those are the two options. So, hey, that marginal propensity to consume bounded between zero and one says, okay, for that extra dollar earned, how much am I going to eat today? 90% 90, 90 of it today? 50% of it today? Ah, depending on what that value is, that's how much consumption will happen from our disposable income today. Uh, okay, next one there, we've already talked about disposable income. We can actually open that guy up a bit to kind of take a look at its prerequisite parts. Why superscript D, disposable income? Well, that's actually one minus our tax rate times our income, right? And keep in mind, income, GDP, output, total expenditure, right? That's what we mean by Y there. So we can open up disposable income into its requisite parts. Carrying on, we have autonomous consumption. So again, that's kind of our base level of consumption. This base level of consumption is going to be determined or influenced by three factors. It's going to be determined or influenced by our expectations of the future. It's going to be determined or it's going to be impacted by our wealth, the wealthier we are. 
the more we're willing to spend, the more stockpile of resources of cash we have to draw from, the less wealth we have, well, the less consumption we can engage in. Finally, it's going to be influenced by our nominal interest rate, that is our cost of credit, our availability of credit. Our alternatively with that, interest rate is going to also influence our savings. So you can think of it in that sense there. Ultimately, it's not saying, hey, think of it in this way or that way. Savings and borrowings are just flip sides of the same coin. In fact, often we will refer to it as savings and dissavings. That is, we'll refer to borrowing as just rather a dissaving. So three factors that influence our autonomous consumption. Keep in mind with that autonomous consumption, income is not one of those. It was expectations, wealth, and nominal interest rate. Next on our list is our business investment, our autonomous investment. So keep in mind, this is investment in capital goods. So new infrastructure, machinery, factories, equipment, tools. This is also inventories and real estate. Now, three things that are going to influence this. And right, these are just generalities. This is a simplification of our model on whole. But three things that are going to influence our autonomous investment are, again, expectations. Hey, we're positive about the future. Hey, that's cool. We're going to increase our investment because we think things are going to be going really good. Second guy is going to be changes in sales. And really, we should say, hey, if expectations is one of those, really what we mean is unexpected changes in sales because expected changes in sales would already be accounted for in our expectations. So, okay, unexpected changes in sales. And the reason why that's going to influence things is because unexpected changes in sales end up influencing our inventories. By influencing our inventories, well, we need to change our inventory investment. So change in sales affects inventories, affecting our inventory investment. Final factor, thing that influences our autonomous investment is going to be changes in the real interest rate. And very similar to how that affects consumption, right, as your business. You have two options. You can either invest in your own business or save that money, as it were, invest in somebody else's business. The real interest rate kind of determines where that goes to. Hey, do you put it in your own? Do you put it in somebody else? Or alternatively, the way to think about it is kind of the same way as consumption, this idea of dis savings or borrowing. You need to finance these large investment projects to build a new factory and the like. If the real interest rate is really low, well, it's really cheap to finance. So you'd be more likely to finance that investment. If the real interest rate was really high, well, okay, really high real interest rate. Ah, it's now expensive to finance it. Maybe not. Government expenditure. Well, this just changes if we say it does, right? So it is what we say it is. In that sense there, just, hey, we'd explicitly say government's expending more. Government is going to do this. Government's going to do that. So it is just what we say it is. Exports. Exports, autonomous exports, again, influenced by only two things. One being our foreign income. And why, why foreign income? Well, because if we jump to the next one, our imports are influenced by our domestic income. If, right, we can see this. If our domestic income goes up, well, so do our imports. The stuff we import is somebody else's exports. So in that same kind of way, if foreign income goes up, well, then they're buying more of our stuff, so our exports go up. The other one that influences our exports is going to be relative prices, that is changes in exchange rates, and changes in exchange rates are going to cause the dollar to appreciate or depreciate and influence exports as a result. So... Okay, let's kind of take all this, let's kind of mash it together, and let's work through actually solving for our equilibrium level of national income. We've done enough talking about it. So, uh, let's change color there. We're going to have our planned aggregate expenditure equals, and I'm going to bring our induced components together. So, okay, our induced components, that's going to be this part and that part. And then I'm going to bring our autonomous components together. So, okay, my induced components, planned equity expenditure equals our marginal propensity to consume. I'm going to open up disposable income into its requisite parts. So 1 minus T times Y. 
I'm then gonna bring in this other part here, my import, so minus my, and then we're gonna go and, that's that taken care of, that's that taken care of, so plus our autonomous, that's a little fancy C, plus I plus G plus X, our autonomous, right? Autonomous expenditure. Okay, we can simplify things a bit. We can simplify things a bit. We can say, hey, we have Y common to both, so we can factor that out. And we're left with our marginal propensity to consume one minus our tax rate, minus M times Y. And then we're gonna have plus C, I, G, and X as our final bit there. Okay, we could have, right? We could have actually made our substitutions from here into there, right at that step there. I wanted to purposely wait to do it at this point here, just so that we could really collapse it all down at the same time. So what we can do now is we can start to make our substitutions. So, okay, marginal propensity to consume, that is 0 0.9 times one minus our tax rate, so one minus 0 0.1, one minus 0 0.1 minus our marginal propensity import, that's 0 0.06 times y, and then we're going to go plus all of our autonomous components here, so that is our autonomous consumption, investment, government, expenditure, and exports, so that was 600, 100, 400, and another 400, and hey, hey, we're good, we can start collapsing this down. So what does that give us? What does that give us? Well, let's work that out. We have our planned aggregate expenditure. That is our planned aggregate expenditure equals all of this guy here. That's gonna be 0.75Y plus all of this guy here. That's my autonomous expenditure. Often we just call that A, but hey, all that works out to, well, six and four is 1,000, 1,400, that's 1,500 altogether. So I get my planned aggregate expenditure to be 0.75y plus 1500. Okay, so we've, we've solved for that. We've solved for that. We have our equilibrium level of national income. Great, awesome. Let's graph this, let's solve. Sorry, we don't have our equilibrium level of national income. I'm getting ahead of myself. We have our planned aggregate expenditure function. We have the expression of that. What we wanna do next is solve for our equilibrium level of national income. But before we do that, let's, let's visualize this, right? And keep in mind, this is just an equation of a line. So we have our vertical axes, we have our horizontal axes. That is, we have our planned aggregate expenditure. We have our actual income. Keep in mind, we also wanna include this 45 degree line, such that along this line, Y equals our planned aggregate expenditure. Drawing our line itself, we'll start off with our autonomous expenditure at 1500. That is our vertical intercept, right? Autonomous expenditure, if income were zero, you put zero in for Y, PAE equals 15. From here, we have an upward sloping line such that rise over run of that line there is 0 0.75. That's our marginal propensity to spend. 0 0.75 there, marginal propensity to spend. That's this all of that garbly goop there. Again, what does that mean? That's, hey, every extra dollar of income, every extra dollar of GDP, how much we're planning to spend domestically. So, okay, what is that? That is our planned aggregate expenditure function. We talked about in the last video where we get our equilibrium level of national income, where actual GDP equals our planned expenditure, and we get Y prime, our equilibrium level of national income. Now, how exactly do we solve for this? Well, we just saw, hey, that occurs where y equals planned aggregate expenditure, so, so let's make that happen. Well, let's go y equals planned aggregate expenditure. 
Okay, well, prime daily expenditure, that equals this stuff on the right. So that's y equals 0 0.75y plus 1,500. Okay, 0.75y, let's get the y's together. So we have y minus 0.75y equals 1,500. That's right, implicitly there's a one in front of that y. We just don't always write it, but there's a one in front of that implicitly. So one minus 0.75 gives me 0.25y equals 1500. Get the y by itself, and we do a little fancy trick here just so we can get this extra term. One over 0 0.25 times 1500. I don't wanna keep scrolling down. I'm just gonna go one of these. I'm gonna say, hey, I'm gonna jump back up over here. And we get y equal to, well, one over 0 0.25, that's four times 1500. So that gives me my answer, y prime equals $6,000. So there's my equilibrium level of national income. All right, great, we have that, we have that, we have our equilibrium GDP, we've solved our Keynes and Cross, we now know where we're at. Again, to kind of talk about what just happened there in our solving, well, we have 1500, that there is our autonomous, this four, where did this four come from? Well, as we went through our algebra, this was one over one minus our marginal propensity to spend, All right? We didn't quite go through it in that way, but that's algebraically what that worked out to. And that is this guy here, we refer to this as our multiplier. And that there refers to how many times a single dollar works its way around our circular flow diagram. If you go back and take a look at that circular flow diagram, it's how many times a single dollar would come from the household back around our whole model, back to the household. In this case here, we'd have a multiplier of four, meaning every dollar goes through this economy four times. Each time it goes around, it gets a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, right? So it only gets its way around four complete times before approaching zero. We have that in this case here. So equilibrium level of GDP ultimately being solved for 6,000. Okay, but hey, this, is, this is nothing new. This is what we were doing last week. So what's going on here? Well, let's keep this model. We'll come back to it in a second. Let's talk about what happens when prices change, right? And in order to talk about changes in prices, what we have to update things is we have to say, well, okay, if we're having prices change, well, okay, as consumption changes, am I talking about changes in real consumption or nominal consumption? As GDP changes, is that a change in nominal GDP or real GDP, right? Is that a change in output or is that the change in the value of output because the price of the output has changed? Ah, we have a problem. So what we need to do as we move forward is we need to update everything and it didn't really matter before. It's why we didn't make a big deal about it. But going forward, if we're going to allow prices to change, we need to be clear that we're talking about real GDP. As we're going through all of this, we're talking about our real consumption, our real investment, our real government expenditure, our real exports, and our real imports. That is, that all has to be measured given a fixed price. That is, we're just looking at the quantity of consumption, the quantity of investment, and on and on and on and on. And Let's take a quick look at why, why this is important. And kind of with that, we can then work through the effect that price changes are gonna have on our model. So let's start off by taking a look at consumption. Okay, so let's suppose that, hey, given my income, given my marginal propensity to consume and all that, Let's suppose that there is $100 that I'm gonna spend on consumption. Okay, so that is how much money I'm spending on consumption goods. We'll say that the price of stuff that I buy is $10, meaning that I can buy how many things? Well, okay, I have $100, the price of each thing is $10. Well, I can buy, I can buy, 10 things, right? That there, 
That's my real consumption. My real consumption is 10 things, right? That's how much I can get. $100 in that sense there. But measuring it in terms of real, we're really kind of trying to get at the actual output. We still have to do the value side of things, but we're getting at that. Okay. Well, let's say that initially prices are fixed. So, okay, this is year one. We fast forward to year two, and you still have $100. Prices are still 10, meaning that your consumption is actually still 10. So, okay, nothing, nothing really too exciting there. Man, I, not, nothing, nothing really happened. Okay, but what happens if, let's say, let's say we have something ridiculous like, let's change colors here for this. Let's go year two, but this time we've had inflation of 10%. That is our prices have increased by 10%. And so, okay, 10% increase in prices. Well, that is what? All of a sudden, I'm still spending $100, right? I'm still saying, okay, out of all my income, $100 goes towards consumption. But prices have gone up by 10%. That is, my prices are now 11. Oh, well, okay. I still have $100 I'm spending on consumption. So that is the nominal value of my consumption has stayed the same, 100, 100, 100. Prices have gone up now. So, hey, how much can I buy now? Well, okay, we can work that out. 100 divided by 11, just like we did before, right? 100 divided by 10. 100 divided by 11 says that I can now buy 9.09090909. So let's go 9.091. So, hey, that's kind of my new real consumption. And what we see is that, hey, the value of my consumption has stayed the same, right? And this is the problem. If we had changes in prices, the value of our GDP could stay the same. The value of our consumption could stay the same because, okay, I'm putting $100 towards consumption. But given changes in prices, my real consumption begins to fall. So what we end up witnessing through this is that if prices go up, my real consumption, the actual amount of things I can buy, the quantity of my consumption begins to fall. And okay, we just worked through this for consumption. We could go through the exact same thing for our investment. We could go through the exact same thing for government expenditure, for exports, for any of our variables, right? We could go through and we could keep putting the same nominal amount towards them. The price of what you're buying changes. And as a result, the real amount would fall. So what we witness is that as prices go up, real consumption goes down. Real investment goes down. Real government expenditure goes down. Real exports go down, right? So all of those drop as prices change. So, okay, let's, let's work through what exactly this means for our model if we begin to allow these prices to change. Let's jump back and take a look. Okay, so let's go and in order to work through this, we just need to make, we just need to make a little assumption. And let's just assume, right, and this is, I would always, if I wanted you to solve this numerically, I would always give you this assumption in the relationship. So let's suppose that for every 1% change in prices, we witness a change in autonomous of 100. Right, and I should say, right, absolute there, absolute there. That is, we're just going to presume this is constant, that, hey, 1% increase in prices would cause a decrease in autonomous of 100. A decrease in prices would cause an increase in autonomous of 100. Because, hey, we worked through this for a price increase. If prices went down... Well, the opposite would actually be true. Our real expenditure could actually increase. So we would have that, that in the reverse case, just, just in case that wasn't popping up. So if we make this kind of assumption, okay, so 1% change in price. So, okay, we had that. 
Oh, sorry. Sorry, let's not say 1%, because I didn't do a 1% change in price. We did a 10% change in price. That's a bit of order of magnitude different. Let's do that. Let's do a 10% change in price, a change in autonomous of 100. There we go. Now we're consistent between what we were saying. Okay. So, and when we did, we witnessed, hey, our change in prices was plus 10%. So what does that mean? Well, like we said, that means real consumption is falling. Real investment is falling. Real government expenditure is falling. Real exports are falling. How much are they falling by? Well, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of each one individually. We could, but that would just be a night. That'd be a mess, right? Why, why get into each of these? We're just going to say, okay, all of them are falling such that our change in autonomous is 100. So, okay, that is a change in autonomous equal to negative 100. So, okay, what's, what's the impact of that? Well, let's go back to our final form. We don't need to go resolve our entire planned aggregate expenditure function. We're now going to have our planned aggregate expenditure function. I'm going to go given my new price, right? So vertical line, just uh, given price one. And my marginal propensity to spend is the same. That's still 0.75. That is, right, if we go back up, we didn't have any change to our marginal propensity to consume. We didn't have any change to our tax rate. We didn't have any change to our marginal propensity to import. That's, that's a bit of hand-waving going on there, but just to keep our math simple, we're going to presume that the marginal propensity to spend is staying constant. Okay, so that times y. Plus, well, we did have a change in our autonomous, right? Change in autonomous of negative 100. So, okay, it used to be 1,500, it decreased by 100, so we now have 1,400. Well, okay, how, how exactly does that work out? Well, we can solve for that, right? And we can solve for that, we can also visualize it. Let's maybe visualize it first so we can kind of get in our mind what we're expecting as our answer. So let's just jump back over to our graph. Actually, here, let's just let's just steal our graph and let's move it somewhere that we can see it a bit better. Okay, so stealing our graph, bringing it over here, we saw that originally we had an autonomous of 1500 and slope of 0.75. We now have autonomous of 1400, so okay, let's exaggerate that a little bit. We don't need it to be to scale exactly. So 1400, no change in our marginal propensity to spend, so we're looking at parallel lines. And that would give me, I'm just going to cut right through that. I'll erase it there in a second, just so that we can keep this kind of clean. There we go. That was our marginal propensity to spend. We have parallel lines, and we have our new planned aggregate expenditure given P1. So, okay, the initial planned aggregate expenditure at the initial price, and we have our new planned aggregate expenditure at our new higher price, right, such that... P1 is greater than P0. All right, we could, we could be a bit more explicit. We could say that was given P0 just so we can remind ourselves. So hey, we see as prices rose, our planned aggregate expenditure shifted down. As our planned aggregate expenditure shifted down, what happened to our equilibrium level of national income? Well, it used to be there. It used to be at the yellow. It's now at the green there. So we would expect a new value of Y prime that's lower, right? That's lower, less than 6,000. So let's solve that. Let's solve that. We're going to have y equals planned aggregate expenditure. That's y equals 0 0.75 times y plus 1,400. Going through all of our algebraic voodoo, I'm going to jump a bunch of steps, but it's the same steps we did the last case. We're going to get y equals... 1 over 0 0.25 times 1,400. That's, well, not T. That's Y equals 4 times 1,400. Or we get a new Y prime of 4 times 1,400, yielding for us 5,600 as our new equilibrium level of national income. Okay, so there we go. We witnessed prices rising relative to P0, and as a result, our 
real GDP falling. So rising prices, falling GDP is measured through our demand, through our expenditure, right? And that makes sense, right? All else equal, if prices go up, well, we might be expending the same amount nominally, but the amount of stuff we can buy is now less. So our real expenditure has fallen. So higher prices, real expenditure falling. Hey, if we're expending less, well, then the real output would be less as well. Less demand, less output. Keeping in mind, this is a demand-driven model, an expenditure-driven model. Our output is determined by our demand. Our output is determined by our expenditure. Okay, let's briefly go through one more example just to kind of flesh out this diagram a bit. And let's just go in the other direction just to see some symmetry here. And that is, let's just say that, okay, this time we have a change in price of minus 10%. And let's suppose we're back at P0. We're starting back at P0 and we're going to go from there. So, okay, if we have a drop in prices by 10%, that is real consumption. Oh, that's actually going up. We're expending the same amount nominally, but everything's cheaper. If everything's cheaper, I get more stuff for the same amount of money. So my real consumption's up. My real investment is up. My real government expenditure is up. And my real exports are similarly up. That is all together, right? Given our assumption that, hey, a 10% change in price is a change in autonomous of 100. They're inversely related, so negative price, positive 100 is my change in autonomous. So, okay, my planned aggregate expenditure given P2 is going to be equal to, well, again, no change in my marginal propensity to spend, so that's still going to be 0 0.75 times Y plus... Well, okay, what did we used to have? We used to have 1500 as our autonomous expenditure. 1500 plus 100 gives me 1600. Going through all of our algebra, right? We set our equilibrium. Y equals 2 PAE. That's Y equals 0 0.75. Y plus 1600. All the same steps we've gone through now. This would be the third time, so let's just jump right to it. That's y equals 4 times 1,600, right? Where does that 4 come from? That's my multiplier, 1 divided by 1 minus my marginal propensity to spend. So I get y prime, my new equilibrium level of GDP, equal to 4 times 1,600 or equal to $6,400. To throw that guy onto our diagram here, well, let's go take a look. So we have 1600. There's our intercept. Again, I'm trying to kind of get a bit of a scale. Like, hey, if that was minus 100, this plus 100, roughly the same. Again, this is a parallel curve to the best that I can. There we go. So, hey, all three of these are parallel, meaning they all have the exact same slope of 0.75. And this is my planned aggregate expenditure given P2, right? And this is such that P2 is less than P0, right? P2 is a smaller price. So, okay, as prices fell, what happened? Well, as prices fell, I get my equilibrium level of national income. That's my condition there, Y equals PAE. Draw that line down. I get my Y prime of 6,400. And we see, okay, what do we have as our general rule here? We have, that is prices rise, real GDP falls. As prices fall, real GDP rises. So we have this inverse relationship between price and output, price expenditure, price and income, right? Keep in mind, output, expenditure, income, GDP, they're all synonyms in this case. Okay, well, let's take advantage of this. Let's take advantage of this and, right, you can imagine this is going to get really ugly really fast. If we try to utilize our Keynesian cross model in a world with changing prices, right, and okay, we're having prices change, but then 
say we have a shock. Say all of a sudden we have the interest rate, we have some change in the interest rate, such as the interest rate increases. Well, okay, hey, interest rate, what's that a determinant of? What does that influence? Well, interest rates, those influence our autonomous consumption. As interest rates go up, consumption, autonomous consumption goes down. So, hey, change in autonomous consumption, that there is just going to be a change in autonomous expenditure going down. So, okay, change in interest rate, decreasing autonomous consumption, decreasing autonomous expenditure altogether, meaning the curve shifts down. But which curve? Well, okay, depending on the price level, or if we wanted to model at all price levels, they would all shift down. Meaning, okay, all of a sudden, just this one little shock, and we've gone from three curves to six curves with six possible different equilibrium level of national income, depending on what the price level is at the time. Oh, that's going to get really messy really fast. So, okay, we need to simplify our model. And in simplifying our model, this is where we're going to jump over to our aggregate demand. So, in order to take a look at our aggregate demand, I'm going to go, I'm going to steal this graph that we're working on right now. So, hey, if you need to redraw this, feel free, pause the video, redraw it. What we're going to do is we're going to steal this and then we're going to draw another graph right underneath it. And that's important. It has to be underneath it. So make sure if you're taking notes, and I hope you're taking notes as you're watching this, not just passively having this on while making dinner or watching TV. As you're taking your notes and working through this, take a, another graph underneath, make sure you have room, and we're going to take a look at these two graphs in conjunction. So there's our Keynesian cross as discussed. And we notice that, hey, as our prices changed from P0, P1, P2, the result was a change in output. So, hey, let's take advantage of that and let's create a new scale, a new graph, in order to represent that relationship. And let's get actual straight lines going on here. There we go. And that is, let's keep our vertical, or sorry, not our vertical, our horizontal axes, we'll keep that the same as real GDP, right? So real output, real expenditure, real income, real GDP. Our vertical axis, we're going to update this to be our price level. And that is our price level. We could just generically refer to it as P0, P1, P2, or more likely what it is, is it's going to be our price level either as measured by our GDP deflator or by our CPI. That is by an index. And it's not going to be too relevant to us at this 104 level which index we use. It's just going to be this idea that we utilize an index. So, hey, let's suppose that we said at P0, let's suppose we were indexed at 100. At P1, well, we jumped 10%, so we jumped up to 110. And at P2, we dropped 10%, so that was going to be. And that's dropping 10%, so that would be something like a CPI of 90. So, okay, if we wanted to draw that through with our price level, let's say, just generically speaking, there we have 100, a little bit lower. Okay, there's 90. And then let's kind of roughly keep this the same, just trying to get at least somewhat of a con constant scale, 110. Okay, then... Hey, real GDP, real GDP, oh, these are the same. Let's just draw these points down. So 5,600 being drawn down. There we go. That would be like such. Our yellow, 6,000. Let's draw that guy down. There we go. Oh, nope, let's keep a straight line. Let's try that again. There we go. So 6,000. And then finally, our blue line down, that's going to be 6,400. Okay, so we have our real GDP. That is each of these equilibrium levels of national income at a different price level transposed down onto this graph. We then have our price levels on the vertical. What we want to do is we just kind of want to essentially connect the colors, right? And I've purposely color coded it so that this can be easy in that sense. And that is we want to bring the green to the green. There we go, uh, straight lines, green to the green. 
we want to bring the yellow to the yellow. And then finally, we want to bring the blue to the blue. And again, straight lines are being hard. There we go. And so what we notice is that, hey, we have a price real output combination there. We have a price real output combination here. And we have a price real output combination there. And as we take a look at these, you can imagine a line connecting all these dots. That is, hey, we drew this for a CPI of 90, 100, and 110, calculating our GDP for each one. But you can imagine like, well, what if, what if we had a CPI instead of like 92? Where would that fit? Well, okay, 92, that would be something, right? Maybe, maybe like that? On and on and on and on. That is, there'd be a whole bunch that we could draw in there. That is essentially what we can end up doing is we can just connect all of these lines. Well, maybe, maybe let's try that again. Connect all these lines. There we go. And we get a downward sloping curve in this sense, such that we get the relationship between different price levels and the corresponding real output. As prices are high, the higher the price level, the less we're able to expend, the less we're able to buy in real terms, all else constant. The lower the price is, well, then the more stuff we're able to buy, the more things we're able to buy, that is the more output we'll end up producing, again, all else constant. This bottom curve here, what, what, what is this guy? Well, this curve, this is our aggregate demand curve. And that is, hey, our Keynesian cross is an expenditure, a demand-driven model saying, hey, how much output are we going to make for a fixed price level? The aggregate demand curve then is just taking that and saying, okay, if we change our price levels, here's going to be how much stuff in real terms we demand, right? Because that's how much real expenditure we're going to be engaging in. And so we get this downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Okay. Back to that last kind of question that we looked at, that last kind of one where we said, okay, maybe we need a new model to work with. We said, what did we say? We said, okay, all of a sudden we had interest rates increasing. If interest rates are increasing, we said that was going to cause consumption to decrease. And that's autonomous consumption there. And we said, okay, if autonomous consumption is decreasing, that is autonomous expenditure decreasing. So Let's, let's work through this now, given our new model. And let's take a look at what exactly that means. And we could do it right here in the form that we have, but hey, let's simplify things a bit. Let's start off just at our P naught, that's that little yellow scenario there. And let's just work through it from that case. So let's jump over and take a look at that. And first we'll just take a look at it algebraically, then we'll add numbers and we'll work through it mathematically. So let's redraw our graphs. Okay, so we have up in the top there, we have our Keynesian cross, autonomous expenditure of 1500. We have that marginal propensity to spend. Uh, we don't have that written in there. Let's, let's update that. We had our marginal propensity to spend. That's our slope of 0 0.75. And then, hey, that's our Keynesian cross given price, uh, price level of 100. And we had our equilibrium level of national income of 6,000. Carrying that down, Vertical down, we get 6,000 real GDP. And then where it bounces off of our aggregate demand curve, right? Uh, make sure we fully label all our diagrams. Bounces off our aggregate demand curve, we have our price level of 100. So question is, right, and this is the big thing, when we're applying shocks, when we're doing anything like this, we have to do one step at a time as you're walking. That is, hey, as we derived the aggregate demand curve, derived the aggregate demand curve, well, the way we derived this was by allowing changes in price level. But we allow changes in price level to happen, everything else in the world being fixed. So that is all those determinants of autonomous consumption, investment, government expenditure, exports, all of those were fixed. That is, hey, fixed exchange rates, fixed government budget, fixed expectations of the future, 
fixed wealth, fixed interest rates, fixed sales, right? All of that was constant. The only thing we were allowing to change was the price level. As we move forward, we're now going to hold the price level constant. So we're now going to fix the price level at 100 and we're going to allow the interest rate to change. And we're going to say, okay, for a fixed price level, if we keep prices constant at 100, what is the impact of this change? So, okay, we can, we can now work that out. That's just kind of our classical Keynesian cross, right? That's what we did before when we first introduced it. We said, hey, prices were fixed. We're just going back to that. So there we go. Prices are fixed, fixed at 100. And we have this increase in interest rate causing autonomous consumption to go down. If autonomous consumption goes down, autonomous expenditure goes down. So that is A goes down. So, okay, A, that was 1500. We're going to have a new value of A. I'm just going to call that A1 for now. Down there, hey, no changes to our marginal propensity to spend. Nothing in there that's going to influence that. So we're going to have parallel lines. There we go. We're going to say these are parallel. And that is my new planned aggregate expenditure given. Still a price level of 100 and my new level of consumption. Well, what is that? How has that worked out? I have my new equilibrium level of national income, Y equals PAE right there. The impact of that is this new lower, oh, let's keep that line as a straight line, new lower level of equilibrium national income. We don't have a number for it right now, but we have this idea that it's lower. And so if we carry that value down there, uh, let's make that more visible. There we go. Carry that straight down. We see, hey, there we go. We would have a new level of equilibrium level of national income, new level of real output on the aggregate demand as well. But here's the question. Where, where are we on this aggregate demand? Right? Are we now finding ourselves right here? That is at a new higher price level? No. No, 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 we aren't, we aren't. And let me explain why. We are not up there because, right, going back to that assumption we had to invoke right at the start, is we said, okay, we're gonna change the interest rate, changing consumption, changing autonomous, assuming a fixed price level. This is that one foot grounded at a time. If one foot is changing price level and the other foot is changing autonomous determinants, well, the price level foot is planted in the ground, only those autonomous determinants get to move. If autonomous determinants are fixed, well then the price level can change, but only one at a time, right? One of the feet always needs to be planted. So that is essentially what we've done, is we've said, okay, we're gonna hold price level fixed here at 100. Now that's, there we go, there we go. We're gonna hold price level fixed right there at 100. This is a fixed price level. So, okay, given this fixed price level, we're now finding ourselves at this lower level of real output. That is, okay, combination of this fixed price level and lower real output, we're finding ourselves right there, right at that red dot. So, hey, how is that possible? How is this, where is this? This isn't even on our aggregate demand curve. No, no, it's not. And the reason why it's not is because this change in one of our components of our aggregate expenditure curve or a fixed price level has caused our aggregate demand curve to shift. So in that case there, decrease in autonomous expenditure ultimately has caused our aggregate expenditure curve to shift inwards. That is, it has caused it to shift to the left. And we would have our aggregate demand one. So I think I was just calling this aggregate expenditure. Sorry, that was my slip up. It has caused our aggregate demand curve to shift to the left. It has caused a decrease in our aggregate demand. And we see that there, right? And the way that we have to work through this is this Keynesian cross. Keynesian cross for a fixed price level has dropped. Keynesian cross, the aggregate expenditure has dropped, decreasing equilibrium level of national income. All of that for a fixed price level of 100. 
That is for this fixed price level of 100, we have less output. This less output, well, that's along that fixed price level, meaning we must have a new aggregate demand, that change in aggregate demand. And that's gonna be the case. Anytime we have a change in autonomous, so that is a change in consumption. Oh, let's try that again, a change in consumption, a change in investment, a change in government expenditure, or a change in exports, that's gonna cause a change in our aggregate demand. Very similarly, and this, this we don't deal with this one as often, but anytime we have a change in our marginal propensity to spend, again, for a fixed price level, that's really gonna be either a change in our tax rate or a change in our marginal propensity to import. If we have a change in either one of these, well, that's gonna change the slope, gonna change our multiplier, and thus gonna change our level of equilibrium national income for a fixed price level. And thus, if we have a change in any of these, it's gonna cause our aggregate demand curve to shift for a fixed price level. And the way that we have to work this out is we have to work through it as to what the impact is on our Keynesian cross. Does it result in a decrease in GDP? Well, okay, decrease in GDP, aggregate demand left. Does it result in an increase in GDP? Well, okay, if it resulted in an increase in GDP, well, then aggregate demand would go right. And maybe let's take a look at a case that would cause an increase in GDP. And in order to evaluate that, well, we've already taken a look at an autonomous shock. Let's take a look at an induced shock. Let's say a change to our tax rate. And let's work through that guy in green here. So again, for a constant price level, fixed prices of 100, let's suppose that the current government decides to cut our net tax rate. So that is they either decide to cut taxes. Hey, everybody, good news. You're paying less taxes this year. Or alternatively, the flip side of it is they've decided to increase their subsidies. They've decided to increase their transfer payments. Maybe this is a payment into employment insurance. Maybe this is in a payment out like our SERB payments, um, social security payments, and the like. So something like that. Ultimately, our net tax rate has fallen. Well, as our net tax rate falls, we can take a look at our marginal propensity to spend. Let's open that guy up. That is our marginal propensity to consume, one minus our tax rate, minus our marginal propensity to import. So okay, if our tax rate is falling, this whole term here, that whole term is getting bigger, right? And if you're like, wait, what is that? Why, why is that getting bigger? Well, just, just throw in some numbers and double check, right? Let's say initially we had one minus, 0.1, well, that gave us 0 0.90. Then drop the tax rate. Say we now have one minus 0 0.05. What do we have now? 0 0.95. So, okay, all right, we see that as the tax rate fell, this whole little term that I have underlined there actually did, truthfully, increase. So, okay, great, I'm not lying. So, okay that whole term there increased. If that whole term increased, well, marginal propensity to consume times a bigger term, all of this then increases. So we can work through that then. We can say, okay, for a falling tax rate, we have an increasing marginal propensity to spend. An increasing marginal propensity to spend, well, what does that do with respect to our graph? And let's, right, suppose we start off at our initial place there of 1,500. Well, bigger marginal propensity to spend means a steeper curve. These guys are drawn for something like 0.75. Steeper curve may be something like, I'm just going to make up a number here, 0.80. If we had something like 0 0.80, and again, just where did that number come from? I just made it up to say that it was bigger. We could start off at the same intercept, steeper slope, something like that. And we would get our planned aggregate expenditure given a price level of 100 and our new tax rate. 
and we get right there our equilibrium condition. We can identify that even without going through all the math. Let's just get rid of that arrow. And working that down, I get my new value of GDP. We'll call that y prime 2. And right, we can carry that guy down. We can carry that guy down all the way. We get some new value of real GDP. And again, keep in mind, all of this is for a fixed price level, price level of 100. And that would be, we'd find ourselves out there. Intersection of our new value of GDP from our Keynesian cross and a fixed price level of 100. So, hey, how do we get out there? Well, this decrease in taxation has caused our aggregate demand curve to shift to shift to the right. So aggregate demand has increased in this case because our marginal propensity to spend has increased. And our marginal propensity to spend has increased because the tax rate has fallen. So we see that the aggregate demand curve shifts to the left and to the right, but that the cause of these jumps in aggregate demand is entirely due to changes in our Keynesian cross. So that is, as we carry on through this semester, as we carry on through this course, what we're going to eventually do is we're just going to get rid of this top model altogether. We're going to say, there it goes. It's gone. We're just going to be dealing with this aggregate demand diagram. Just the same, we're going to make statements like the interest rate increases. We have to kind of behind the scenes work through what that means in the Keynesian cross sense. And then by working out what that means in the Keynesian cross sense, okay, interest rate up, autonomous consumption down, autonomous expenditure down. Hey, 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 that also means real GDP down for a fixed price level, thus aggregate demand to the left. Or on the other case, okay, our tax rate fell, marginal propensity to spend went up. Okay, marginal propensity to spend going up means we went for a steeper aggregate expenditure. So bigger marginal propensity to spend, steeper curve, or the other way you can think of this, steeper marginal propensity to spend is a bigger multiplier. All of that, again, means that real GDP has increased. So you have to work through that behind the scenes and then say, okay, real GDP has increased, aggregate demand has shifted to the right, because all this happened for a fixed price level. So Right now, we'll keep that Keynesian cross hanging around just so that we can view it. But pretty soon, carrying onward, we're just going to drop that Keynesian cross. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't disappear at all. It just stays there behind the scenes, and we just kind of have to think about it in that behind the scenes kind of way. Okay, it's slowly coming back here. Uh, but let's go work through another kind of example in this case and bring in some math. Now, for those of you who were panicking with the math as we went through the Keynesian cross model, well, good news for you as we move on to our aggregate demand, aggregate supply, that math really does fall away. We're not going to have much math carrying forward with us, but there still will be a little bit. So let's take a look at that little bit of math that remains with us and we'll carry on from there. Okay, so let's work through now an example numerically, so actually with the math involved, and see exactly how this fits through. And keep in mind, we're actually fairly limited into what we can do with this sense. So again, for those of you who are not so mathematically inclined and were very thrown off by the last few, the last few examples, that last really section on the Keynesian cross, well, you have some hope. The math's still going to be here going forward, but it's not going to be nearly as much. So... Let's take a look at an example, and in this case, let's suppose that all of a sudden, we'll say that all of a sudden we have a very positive expectation of the future. So we have a very positive expectation of the future. We think that, hey, we're going to be getting raises. We're pretty sure that we're going to be keeping our jobs. Things are looking pretty rosy. So get this positive expectation of the future. This is going to influence both. Uh, expectations are both part of autonomous consumption as well as autonomous investment. And in both these cases, a positive expectation of the future increases our consumption and it increases 
our investment. Let's put a let's put an amount to this. Let's say that it increases both of these by let's say two hundred dollars altogether. Okay, so there we go. We have a boost all together to consumption and investment by two hundred dollars. What what exactly do we do with this? Well, let's keep in mind that this is autonomous consumption, autonomous investment. So both of these are part of autonomous expenditure. That is, our autonomous expenditure was just plus 200. So, hey, we had initially 1,500 here. We're now plus 200. We're going to have our new planned aggregate expenditure. That's going to be given our price level of 100, fixed price level. And our new consumption, new investment equals, same marginal fancy to spend, no change there, 0.75y plus uh, 1,500 plus 200, that's going to be 1,700. Now, right, this here, if you're not so solid with the math, a great way to do this is to work through this just with the graph first, kind of get an idea as to where you're starting and where you might end up. So you can actually work through it and say, hey, I'm where I thought I'd be, good, that's a good sign. Or, uh-oh, that's not where I expected, maybe a red flag, maybe I need to rework my math. So let's go take a look at that. So what's happened? We've had a boost of our autonomous of a plus 200. That is plus 200 brought us to 1700 there. Let's go draw this new aggregate expenditure curve. Keeping in mind, no change in our marginal propensity to spend. So these are parallel lines. And this is our new planned aggregate expenditure, still price level of 100, but with our new consumption and our new investment. At this, we're going to have our equilibrium, Y equals PAE. Draw that line down right there. We'll get some new value of real output some new value of real output but what we notice is hey we're now at that still that fixed price level of 100 we're now at this point right here that is what we'd be expecting is our aggregate demand curve to be shifting to the right that's uh there we go shifting to the right something like that so aggregate demand one aggregate demand shifting to the right what we want to figure out is, well, what is the magnitude of that shift? How much has that shift, how much has our real output, our real expenditure increased by given this fixed price level? So, okay, let's go solve that. So to solve that, we have our new aggregate expenditure. We just want to solve for our new equilibrium level of national income, just like we've done several times now. So Y equal to our new planned aggregate expenditure. And right, all that garbly goop there, price level of 100, C1, I1. Okay, this, that equals that. So Y equals 0 0.75Y plus 1700. Going through all of our mathematical voodoo there, all of our algebraic manipulations, we're going to get Y equals 4 times 1700. And right, how exactly we went through that? Well, we moved that 0.75 over. That gave us 0.25y. 1 over 0.25y gives us 4 times 1,700. Again, that's our multiplier times our autonomous. So 4 times 70 1,700 gives us a new equilibrium level of national income of 6,800. There we go. There we go. What we'll notice is, in this case, we had an increase in autonomous of 200, and that increase in autonomous of 200 resulted in an increase in GDP. But how much did our GDP increase by? 68 from 6. So, hey, that was plus 800. What we witness is that, hey, a $200 change in our autonomous expenditure had a larger change in our real output. What's the relationship between 2 and 8? Well, $200 change times our multiplier gave us the change in output. 
So four times 200 gives us our $800. So that is, we could also write this as the change in Y prime equals our multiplier times the change in autonomous. And right, that gives us four times, what was our change in autonomous? 200, 200, and that gives us a change of 800. Keep in mind, if you ever want to utilize this form, this is just giving us the change in GDP, not the new value, right? We don't have a new value of GDP of 800. We have a change in GDP of plus 800. That is our new value of GDP is 6,800. And hey, where that was the vertical shift in output due to this change in the Keynesian cross, it is also the magnitude of our shift at least the horizontal shift for our aggregate demand curve, right? For a fixed price level, output to output, that horizontal distance, which our aggregate demand just shifted, was plus 800. Plus 800. So some of these aspects through our Keynesian cross flow through to our aggregate demand. However, once we start changing the price levels on our aggregate demand, well, things are going to kind of stop and end there. Okay, that does us for our video on the aggregate demand curve. We've worked through quite a few examples into how to work through this. We've introduced, well, reintroduced the Keynesian cross. We've then seen how by changing that fundamental assumption of constant prices on the Keynesian cross, we can derive the aggregate demand. We then talked about how we have to take this like one step at a time approach. We can either change prices and get the derivation of our aggregate demand curve, or we can hold prices fixed, change other determinants in the Keynesian cross, and get shifts of our aggregate demand curve. Big part as we go forward is understanding how that aggregate demand curve is derived. And then once we have that understanding of how it's derived, being able to using comparative statics, that is those little shocks to different parts of our Keynesian cross, work out, hey, all of a sudden, wealth has increased, the stock market's booming, everybody's making money on the stock market. What impact does that have on the aggregate demand, right? Being able to work through that kind of flow through and being able to shift the aggregate demand either to the right, increasing it, or shifting that aggregate demand to the left, decreasing it. In our next video, we're going to introduce the other half of this model, our aggregate supply. And then as we bring those two together, we'll then take a look at our short run macroeconomic equilibrium and talk about why that's an equilibrium, our business cycle and adjustments to our long run period. If you have any questions though about anything we've covered in this video, please feel free to reach out to me. You can comment below, post on the D2L frequently asked questions, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.